Hello, and welcome back to the Book of Revelation, Historicist View. This is Part 4, Chapter 1. You know, over the years, Revelation has become like an old friend to me. But this time through is the first time that I've really begun to see the first chapter as the most important chapter in the entire book. Messiah went to great lengths to set the stage for this very important message that he's about to share with John, with us. So let's get right to it. We're going to begin at the beginning. And we're going to look at the prologue, which contains the purpose of the book, a little bit about the author, and that blessing. So, starting with the purpose, right away we see in chapter 1, verse 1, that this is Jesus's revelation, not John's. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, I think we all want to know the will of God for our lives. I certainly do, and I hear it a lot from people. So there really shouldn't be anything more important than that. And though over the years I've heard people say that they are too afraid to read this book, or they don't think they can understand the language, or maybe that they just don't believe it's relevant for them. And I'm thinking, you know, Jesus Christ wants to show us things that must shortly come to pass. What could be more important than to know what it is he wants us to know? So let's just dive in. And let's see that if he wants us to know it, we're going to be able to follow it and understand it and know his will, at least where it concerns our future. Let's begin with this word shortly, because, again, with this historicist view, we need to come to see that this began the moment John received it. So let's look at this verse using the Strong's Concordance numbers. Now that's just a dictionary that in this case shows us the Greek words behind the English ones. So when we look at the word shortly, the English translation, we see that there are actually two Greek words. And the main one is the Greek number G5034. It's takos. And this definition tells us it's a brief space of time. But we'll notice that there's actually a second number. There are two Greek words there. And the Strong's definition tells us that when the Greek number 1722 is prefixed to takos, it changes the meaning, and now it becomes in haste, quickly, shortly, speedily. Does that sound like 2,000 years plus before things get started? Not to me. So the purpose of the book is that Jesus Christ wants to show us something that is about to begin. All right, let's look at the author of the book of Revelation. And we find out in chapter 1, verse 2, that it's John who is bearing record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. But you probably won't be surprised if I tell you there's no small debate today on the authorship of the book of Revelation. Is it John the Disciple, John the Apostle, John of Patmos, or John the Elder? Is it the Beloved Disciple? Well, the traditional view holds that John of Patmos is identical with John the Apostle, who is believed to have written both the Gospel of John and Epistles of John. And he was exiled to the island Patmos in the Aegean Sea during the reign of Emperor Domitian in the year 95 AD. Now that makes the book of Revelation about 25 years too late to be helpful with the preterist view, which says everything was fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. John very quickly goes on to tell us a little more. He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now we're going to see this phrase several more times, and it's not by accident. 
Jesus means to identify his audience with this descriptive phrase throughout the book of Revelation. And it's part of the reason I have found the book to be primarily a book about salvation. Let's look at the blessing now. And Revelation 1 verse 3 tells us, Blessed is he that reads. We're going to break this down because we know in John's day, this would have been written on a scroll. Someone is going to read it. But that word there in the Greek actually means to know again, and by extension to read it. You look at it again and again and again. You're learning it. You're knowing it. You're studying it. So I'm going to put the idea of studying it. Like a teacher would prepare to read to his class, and he knows it again. And then those that hear the words, well, there's going to be an audience. And this is more than just a passive listening, but intently hearing, grasping. The word actually means to understand. And then you have to keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And keeping those things is a little harder to define. It really means to guard, to guard from loss or injury. And the idea being uh, keeping it alive, keeping it relevant. You know, you, you want to pass it on and share it. The idea of studying this word, understanding this word, and guarding it, keeping it from loss or injury, is the idea of passing it on. It's almost a cycle. We, we keep this alive. And that's the one thing that I found most, I guess, disturbing because in my study, this is what was the general knowledge of the book of Revelation throughout the Reformation and certainly the years afterwards. This is what our founding fathers knew about the word and believed. And today we've lost that. Today it has not been passed down or passed on. It has become irrelevant for so many people. Uh, we're not reading it, studying it. We're not hearing it and under taking it in and understanding it. And we're certainly not guarding it and keeping it relevant and alive. Well, if that is how you receive the blessing, to read it, hear it, and keep those things which are written in it, what is the blessing actually? Let's talk about that for a minute. The blessing is certainly knowing the purpose of the book, knowing the purpose of the judgments, the plagues, and understanding the bigger picture um, I'm going to tell you these things now and instead of springing them on you as we go along, but the seals are meant to weaken Daniel's fourth beast. Remember that strong beast with iron teeth that subdued the whole world and crushed everything under its feet? We know now that that was the Roman Empire, and certainly there can be no denying that for the early church, there was much persecution and we're going to see the fifth seal of martyrdom. Um, just horrifically, these people were dying <clears throat> and at the hand of Rome and, and the emperors. So it's good news to those Christians. It was good news to them that these seals were meant to weaken this beast. And then we're going to see that the trumpets actually take it down. It is going to be gone. This Roman Empire, this beast that has been so um, ardent and so uh, long-standing is going to be defeated. But it's going to be revived or reincarnated, and it's going to bring back another beast with it. We'll see the beast from the sea and the beast from the land. But that's okay. The bowls are going to weaken the reincarnated beast kingdom. And we'll see how throughout history that happened. We'll see who that kingdom, that reincarnated kingdom was and how it was weakened by the bowls. And then of course, um, that won't go away completely until Messiah's final return, but we're so close. I think you'd be surprised how close we are. And then what a blessing to know that Messiah's kingdom will fill the earth and never be destroyed, never be taken down. Uh, this is the blessing, and this, even to 
our forefathers who were experiencing this in real time, uh, and we still are today, don't get me wrong, but even in the worst of it, when they, they were dying and they were being martyred, um, still to know that all of this is not because God is angry at his people. God is saving his people from this kingdom and this reincarnated, if you will, kingdom that has been so oppressive to his people. That is a blessing. This is the final revelation from Jesus Christ. It is climatic to everything else the prophets saw. Revelation is absolutely the complementary bookend to Genesis. Uh, Jesus was there in the beginning. He's going to be here at the end. He's going to see this through. And his church, once again, needs to rightly divide this word. Now let's look at the greeting. And this is where John says, Grace and peace unto you. Now the word grace comes from a primary verb and it actually means to be full of cheer, to be happy. Peace also is a primary verb meaning to be quiet or still. So John is saying, be happy, be still. And then he tells us that this greeting is coming from the Father, who is, who was, who is to come, the eternal I am. And the Spirit, actually John says the seven spirits which are before the throne, but most commentators believe that might have been indicative of the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit, because this is one of those examples where we see the Father, the Spirit, and the Son all together. And the Spirit is before the throne and ready to be dis dispatched, which is pretty cool. Then we see the Son, Jesus Christ, the faithful and resurrected martyr. The word is witness, but that's really where we get our English word martyr. It's martus. And it's important because Jesus is reminding his readers that he himself was martyred, but rose from the dead, and his faithful will follow his lead. Next, John tells us that Jesus is the prince of the kings of the earth. Now, this is a pretty significant thing to tell us as well, because as Rick Renner says from celebrating 30 years in the former Soviet Union with you, his article, The Prince of the Kings of the Earth at Renner.org, he says, quote, it is significant that John used this terminology to depict Jesus in the beginning of the book of Revelation. As he wrote these words in the latter years of the first century A.D., early believers were already suffering greatly at the hands of evil rulers. So John reminded them, and us, from the onset of his message that Jesus holds the ultimate authority and commands the final say in all matters. John boldly proclaimed that Jesus is the most highly exalted king and that he possesses supreme power and authority more than any ruler or government that will ever exist in the earthly sphere. This makes me think of Job and how the Lord gave Satan permission to buffet him, but only as far as he was allowed. That's kind of what John is telling us here, that Jesus is on top of this and he's the prince of these kings. They can only do what he commands. The next thing he tells us is that he loved us and washed us with his blood and made us kings and priests unto God. And then John reminds us that He's coming again with the clouds and that every eye shall see him. In fact, we're told that in chapter 1 and we're told that in chapter 22, the only book that has the promise of his return in the first chapter and the last. Now, right in the middle of John's greeting, he inserts Jesus' words, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. Now, most people know that Alpha is the first Greek letter and Omega is the last Greek letter. Why is this such an important proclamation? And we're going to see Jesus make it several times, actually. Because by choosing the first and the last Greek letters, he was making a huge statement. It's kind of like our saying, everything from A to Z. It's the beginning, it's the ending, and it's everything in between as well. Now, if you're familiar with Hebrew... You might have heard about the hidden treasure in the scriptures, the Aleph Tav. Now, Aleph being the first Hebrew letter and Tav 
the last Hebrew letter. Hebrew reads from right to left. Uh, this would have been Jesus' native tongue, the mother tongue, if you will. And most likely he would have used that saying with his disciples that he's the Aleph Tav, just like the Alpha Omega. It means the same thing. And um, if you're not familiar with this idea of the Aleph Tav, I encourage you to Google it to see all that is in the idea there. But Samuel Koike wrote a book called I Am the Aleph Tav, in which he unveils the presence of Jesus in the Old Testament, first by taking a deep dive into the mystery of the Aleph Tav, although this symbol, he says, appears 9,612 times in the Old Testament, it is never translated. And he shows how there are parallels between the Old Testament and the statements that Jesus made to John in the book of Revelation, where Jesus proclaimed that he was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, or in the Hebrew way, the Aleph Tav. Now the first example we have of this in the scriptures is Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And I don't purport to know Hebrew, but I can show you an example of this 9,612 times that this Aleph Tav is untranslated and why it's so significant. Here we have, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I won't try to say that in Hebrew, although I have a, a few times. But what I want you to notice is the Aleph Tav right there in the middle. It's the fourth word. And then here's another Aleph Tav that is not translated. So um, this is an example of 9,612 times where this is untranslated. And then Jesus shows up in the book of Revelation and tells John that he is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And it's almost as if he's saying to his Hebrew readers, I'm the Aleph Tav. I've been there the whole time. That's me, the Aleph Tav. Now the phrase, the first and the last, or the beginning and the ending, only shows up in Revelation. It shows up five times. Jesus is going to say this five times in the New Testament. But it does show up in Isaiah four times where we're told that God is the first and the last. So here Jesus is really just saying, I am the beginning. I am the ending. I was here when things began and I will be here to wrap things up. Next in verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Let's take a minute and look at this phrase, the Lord's day. Most of us probably have the idea that John is telling us that it is a Sunday that he is having his vision, but that might not be the case here. This phrase occurs only once in the New Testament here in the book of Revelation. But every other time in the scriptures, the New Testament, that they want us to know it is a Sunday, a different phrase is used. They use the phrase, the first day of the week. Now, I bring this up because we can begin to see something more important coming into light. When we understand it's not going to be until the middle of the second century before there's an undisputed example of the believers starting to call Sunday the Lord's Day, and probably because of this verse. So it's a little bit like which came first, the chicken or the egg. I bring it up again because I think it can be shown to have another possible meaning that flows better with the book of Revelation. Matthew Irvin of Apple Eye Ministries says, quote, The issue here is whether or not the Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10 is referring to Sunday. I contend that it is absolutely not. He continues, The Lord's Day is to be more literally translated as a Lordian day. This is what is referred to elsewhere in the Bible as the Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord is used 19 times in the Old Testament and four times in the New Testament. In addition to this, it is called that day quite often. It ultimately refers to a time of great trouble 
and the visitation of the Lord upon the earth. John's apocalypse is covering the day of the Lord as the book is recording what the tribulation will entail and the second coming of Christ. So, he says, the Lord's day in Revelation 1.10 is easily understood in the context of John writing to seven churches to inform them that he was shown a vision of the day of the Lord. Also, the Day of the Lord, an essay written by Jason S. DeRushi of the Gospel Coalition, says, quote, The Old Testament portrays the Day of the Lord as punishment through overlapping images of cataclysm, war, and sacrifice. It highlights the day as renewal by emphasizing how God's presence will rest on his people in the midst of a messianic Davidic reign. The New Testament then identifies Christ Jesus as the one who fulfills the ultimate day of the Lord, inaugurating it in his death, resurrection, and consummating it at his second coming. So this idea of it being the day of the Lord that John is seeing rather than a Sunday when he receives a vision is just undergirded by the idea of these judgments he's seeing roll out one at a time. Um, as a third witness, if you will, the book of Revelation describes the day of the Lord as an apocalyptic time of God's almighty wrath, which comes upon those who are deemed wicked. The text pictures every man hiding in the rocks of the mountains during a major earthquake to attempt to hide from God's wrath, while celestial phenomena turn the moon blood red and the sun dark. These celestial phenomena are also mentioned in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 31, which foretells the same precise order of events mentioned in Revelation. The moon turns blood red and the sun turns dark before the great day of the Lord. Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31, mentions the same event, yet it places the celestial phenomenon as occurring after the tribulation of those days. According to these passages, it then seems that the day of the Lord is an event closely tied with the coming of the Messiah to judge the world. So again, this idea of it possibly being um, the day of the Lord that John is seeing rather than a Sunday, uh, just because we know it wasn't in common use that at that time. Now, we can't prove that, but it's much more impactful. Again, even though we're looking at the next 2,000 years of Revelation being uh, the, this unrolling of these 21 judgments, uh, it definitely fits the scriptural idea of God's judgment playing out against the beast of Daniel and its reincarnation. The next thing that John tells us is the Messiah repeats his Alpha and Omega statement, the first and the last, and tells John to write what he sees in a book and to send it to the seven churches in Asia. Now, Jesus actually names those churches, so it turns out after all that uh, this wasn't necessarily on John's mind. Jesus instructs John to write to the seven churches of Asia Minor. All right, we're going to take just a minute or two to look at these seven churches. We'll cover the pros and cons of each church next time, but I want to consider them together as a whole for just a moment. This is the area known as Asia Minor. It's the western portion of modern-day Turkey. It was also known as Anatolia. And this is where the island of Patmos is located, right off the coast of Asia Minor. Now let's get a close-up view of that area. It's been suggested that John could have envisioned each church as he wrote their letter. It certainly is interesting that the Lord had him incarcerated right off the coast uh, where these letters are going to be sent to these seven churches. But there's a lot of different ideas about these greetings uh, to these seven churches of Asia Minor. Some say that they represent the seven church ages or stages of development the church will go through. Others say that the number seven is the number of perfection and completion. And so they really mean to include all of the churches and then there's the idea that John felt maybe a certain sense of responsibility to these particular churches. Um, there is indication that John may have ministered at Ephesus. But in fact, there are two predominant views of the letters 
to the seven churches. The first one is the historical view, which says that John wrote these letters to seven actual churches in first century Asia Minor for the purpose of diagnosing their present spiritual condition. It also recognizes the observable fact that these cities were placed into a particular order based upon their location in the circular postal route of roads in Asia Minor. Therefore, their sequence has an objective practical purpose. Now, in other words, the order in which John wrote the letters matches exactly with how the letters will be delivered in their postal routes. The other view is the prophetic view, which says that John wrote these letters to seven actual churches in Asia Minor, but also believes that John wrote for the greater prophetic purpose of describing seven eras in church history spanning from the first century to the second coming of Christ, and I've already mentioned that. But let's look at the total number of, of churches um, in 70 AD, at least. There were no less than 34 churches and 15 churches right in the area of Asia Minor at that time. It's kind of hard to believe that he only wrote to seven because they were all gone, even though it's been suggested that maybe in this area these seven were the only ones that remained. But I want to suggest perhaps another possibility, and that is, uh, like in everything, it's important. Location, location, location. We're going to see that in just three short centuries, Constantinople will become the new capital of the Roman Empire under the sixth seal judgment. And another century later from that, this same seat of power, if you will, will set the stage for the fallen Roman Empire to be reincarnated. So the fact that these churches reside in the shadow of all that is coming, perhaps the Lord was speaking directly to them because they would feel the blunt of much that is to come. Next, we're going to look at the vision, what John actually saw, and we see in chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, he says, On turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. So the obvious is that Jesus' hair is white. And before we even ask what that is about, we're not quite finished with Daniel. I want to compare this vision that John has to the vision that Daniel had in chapter 7, the same vision where he sees the four beasts, the four Gentile kingdoms, and he's just finished describing that fourth kingdom, that fourth beast, which is terrible, and John is distraught. He's beside himself, but that's not the end of his vision. In chapter 7, Verses 9 and 11, he goes on to describe, And as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. Now, John is describing the Ancient of Days here, and he's talking about the Father because in verse 13 of that same chapter, he describes one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds who approaches the Ancient of Days, and he's given an everlasting kingdom and dominion and glory that shall not pass away. So when we compare this Ancient of Days John's um, to John's vision of the Messiah, the glorified risen Messiah, we have to say, wow, they're one and the same, really. Um, has Jesus really aged or what's going on? Well, we have to remember that these are just symbols. I believe John is telling us that like father, 
like son, they are one and the same. Jesus did not come to do his own thing. He's not a rebellious son, and God the Father did not make any mistakes that he had to clean up. We're going to see in this beautiful book the continuity of the entire scriptures come alive and come together in a harmonious symphony. This is the risen Messiah Jesus, who is the Ancient of Days, the Everlasting Father, and John and Daniel both agree that he's here at the beginning and he's here at the ending. The next thing we see is Jesus telling John for the third time that he is the first and the last, and he tells him that he holds the keys to hell and to death. And then he gives John some instructions. He says, John, write the things which thou hast seen. Now I wanna take a minute and suggest that the Gospel of John, which is sometimes called the spiritual gospel, we know that it was probably composed between 90 and 100 of the Common Era. Its style and presentation clearly set it apart from his other three epistles. And remembering that John was exiled to Patmos in 95 or 96 AD, it's quite possible that the Lord commissioned John to write his gospel at this time, and that certainly would have taken care of the things which John had seen. He testified of the uh, ministry of the Lord here on the earth. But the next thing he's told to do is to write the things that are. And certainly chapter 1, John being at Patmos and his vision of the Messiah, those things are happening at the moment. And chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches that are or that exist, and he'll be writing about their spiritual condition. Next, John is told to write the things which shall be hereafter and the historicist view suggests that that's chapters 4 through 22, the next 2,000 years of history. We're almost finished now, but I wanted to just remind you that last time we talked about Jesus telling John that the seven stars in his hand were the angels or heavenly representatives of the churches. And now we see that he tells them that the seven candlesticks are the churches. I want to touch base a little bit on the menorah. The perpetually burning light of the menorah meant that there was always a glow coming from within the tent of meeting. In essence, the message was the lights were on and the occupant was home. It was meant to comfort the people and to remind them that the God of the universe has made his home with them. And now Jesus is telling John and us that he's walking amongst our fellowships. So we, we can assume that the seven candlesticks he's walking amongst are those seven churches that he's about to address. And even though a stern warning is coming to all but two of those churches, we're going to discover that that warning is couched in love. So next time on the book of Revelation, Historicist View, we're going to look at part five, seven letters of love. I hope that you can join me. And until then, stay well. Happy studying and shalom.